For, for GPs and for commissioners, and I, I would say, look, this, this really does work and it makes a difference, not just to the patient, but also to the, to the practice um, and, and also to NHS. I suppose you're effectively getting patients seen by the right person who can deliver the right care. Um, you know, there's no point in a GP seeing someone to talk about housing because they, they can't help, or someone to talk about benefits. I, I don't know anything about benefits. And so I think if you've got someone in the practice who can, who can offer that, those, those services or um, something which will match the needs of the patient, um, then that will be really successful. And, and you'll find that the GPs will end up seeing the right patient and, and, and that will hopefully be a, a less of a burden on, on general practice and make it work more effectively. So that would be my advice. Um, and so, yeah, get on with it. <laughs>I think the advice I'd give to other areas developing social prescribing would be very much to take their time. I think that what we're seeing the benefits locally within Merton are because we really took our time to design the intervention well. We had a substantial planning phase of four or five months to make sure that we didn't want to just jump straight in with delivering interventions. So what, what really made this work I think is having everyone around the table and I think having uh, public health, uh, the CCG, um, and also the voluntary sector uh, around the table to discuss you know, how we were going to roll this out, that really helped. Those key partnerships, we have a very active and successful partnership with the CCG, the local authority, but also a thriving voluntary sector. We're fortunate to have an umbrella organisation, MVSC, to be able to coordinate some of those responses. And so that was a real important factor for us. But the starting point was really back to those, that strategic approach. You know, the strategic approach that social prescribing plays an important role in our prevention framework and how we can engage communities and linking in with those key services in the voluntary sector. I think if there's a GP practice where you get somebody who's a real enthusiast and a champion, definitely link with that person and find out how they would explain it to their colleagues because I think having somebody that the medical professionals trust already to explain what social prescribing is, that's really useful. I'm planning. And the planning has been really between the agencies, so um, the voluntary service, um, the clinical commissioning group and public health in the council. We all sit down, look at, and we learn from others. We went out there, look at what, what um, you know, Bromley by Boy is doing, look at what others are doing across the country and see how we can learn from that. And because we also piloted um, um, uh, um, Community Navigator here, we also looked at, at that as well what were the, 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 the downside of, especially the, the early stages, because it was, it's important when the social prescriber comes, that person is part of the team, is embedded in GP practices, is part of the team, and work with them. So it's not just the, the, the GPs, but also the whole practice team here. I can see that if there was some kind of training for social prescribers, that having that piece of paper would probably reassure a lot of people to say, I've done this. Um, I can see some kind of coaching element of the qualification might be useful to help as well as active listening and all those kind of things that probably most link workers have done at other parts of their job. I think everybody could probably make suggestions about areas of their skills that they want to work on. It might be different for everybody but I can see that might be reassuring and useful. I think there are some professional networks already that are extremely useful so being able to link with other social prescribers. GP surgeries definitely people can tend to shut their door and then you're in the room on your own and sometimes I think you need to speak to your colleagues to find out about what problems were and how they solved it. Um, those kind of networks are always useful, speak to other people doing the same job. The do what I did when I started, I read evaluation reports from various schemes and just saw the benefits, the benefits speak for themselves. Every social prescribing scheme I ever know has always been successful and all, all the GPs and the staff in the, in the surgeries have got nothing but praise for a service. It makes their life so much easier because we can offer a service that they can't. <laughs> Find someone like Ray, <laughs> that's the first thing. Be open about it, I think, and uh, sort of be supportive of the social prescriber because, you know, they're doing a very good job and uh, we need to refer more. Um, I think it's lack of awareness maybe for some clinicians because 
say that perhaps it's not advertised well enough, I don't know, but people don't seem to, and initially didn't refer as much. I think things are picking up now, but yeah, also opportunistically spotting uh, likely cases that would benefit, that would be useful some way to measure the outcomes that everybody agreed. So whether that's the same codes on EMIS, whether that's um, something that makes it easy for the voluntary sector organisations to feedback about whether it was supportive to people or not. So that's challenging because every little, well whatever size, not even small ones, every voluntary organisation, they have their own way of measuring things, they have their own funders, often multiple funders that are different requirements of what they measure. So like it's got to be easy for the GPs to refer patients or they just can't engage with it. It's got to be easy for the voluntary sector organisations to feedback that information about how they've supported people. And, and something where, like the NHS professionals are so good at saying this is more effective than this and we know that for certain so we're going to do this instead, um, it would be good to know how often to follow up with people because sometimes people get better, they, you know they've definitely benefited from it, they go off to the voluntary sector organisations and then it'd be really nice to know if somebody has a dip to keep those contacts going and to find out how that person's done and if we can get back in touch with them again. I think there's a couple of things, a couple of key ingredients that help that work. I think number one, having engagement of a GP practice. Um, some of the work that we've seen and done elsewhere hasn't necessarily had that and we haven't had the activity or the traction that we'd like. So I think that's a very core component of it. I think also having some embedment in the, in the voluntary sector is important because those are the services that you eventually want to refer to. So having uh, a model where maybe the base of the project is, is there in, in, in terms of the Merton model. They have a, a host of po host of post type model where the CCG funds it, but the social prescriber is actually employed by the local voluntary sector council or local voluntary sector organisation. And a lot of the training and the relationship building that they do with the wider sector is done through that avenue. And I think that helps a lot. Um, good access to the IT systems is always good. Um, the start of the pilot we had some challenges with having access to the computer systems and it was always more difficult because we I ended up having to ask medical professionals to add notes to people's notes and it was just an extra job for them to do so I think if that can all be set up it just makes it easier for the patients which is what everyone wants at the end of the day and easier for the GPs. Um, I think having a navigator who has the experience and understanding of what exactly they're doing um, so they need to understand the local voluntary sector so they can signpost appropriately, but they need to have the other skills around, you know, sort of having to be able to empathise with a, a patient or um, having some motivational interviewing skills to be able to have that conversation. Um, um, I think having a safe, quiet space to talk to people is really important as well, so that just makes a difference to people being able to open up and talk. Um, and I think being open to new ways of working together, there's lots of exciting things that come up that come out of suggestions and give yourself the time to develop those as well, whether that's um, giving the admin staff, front of house staff all the information about how they can look up voluntary groups for people, having community stalls in the GP surgery foyer, um, going to the same meetings, all of those things can be really exciting and open up new support for people at the end of the day, which is what everybody wants. I think the other thing that we did that was quite unique was that we purchased a license for the wellbeing star here and I think that helped um, navigators almost construct what their appointment was, was going to look like so they do the initial greeting but to get the conversation going and to really pinpoint where the need is they work their way around the star according to the criteria that's there. So I think those, those key areas put together have helped, really helped set off what we have in, in, in East Merton and what we're trying to develop now in the West. It's, it's a valuable service for our patients. Uh, there's a demand for it and I would certainly um, advise any practice out there who wants to become involved to do it because there's a demand for, for, for it. We really need to develop that, build on the partnerships that we had, create the right pathways, get the right people to be delivering and really embed social prescribing within the local clinical systems. So I think one of the key bits of advice really is to take their time, learn from lots of other boroughs and what has gone well, but also the challenges and the opportunities that, that, that they've overcome. But take your time and talk to lots of other people. Anything different and change can always feel like a lot of hard work before the benefits pay off. 
And I know that there was a little bit of a reluctance um, within the practice for like, oh, it's another referral form, and you know, can't we just tell patients to self-refer? Um, but actually, once you've done it a few times and the system is quite easy, you get used to the form. The form has been designed to be really very, very simple. Um, that's, it's just try and remember that the, the effects at the end will be worth that little bit of, it's not even work, it's just that feeling of it's a yet another thing to do and remember to do that actually it pays off in, in the end. Just be open to it um, and actually the benefits will, will be there. And patients love it.